Well, we've certainly talked a lot about kind of how to diagnose this important under-recognized issue and the nuance of approaching the conversation and involving the entire interdisciplinary team. Um, I'd like to shift our focus now and talk about the treatment options for opioid-induced constipation. And I'll start, uh, Rick, by turning to you and asking you to give us kind of a sense of the, uh, the, the uh, environment treatment landscape. Sure. Thanks, David. I, you know, we talk, I already talked a little bit about lifestyle changes. I'm going to skip over that, the, the increased fluids that are really important still. And, and so the, the three things that I think of, at least the classes of how to approach this, is first the simple OTC drug. So I think it was brought out earlier, and it's fair, um, several comments that were made by my fellow panelists that if you have a really high bowel function index, maybe these aren't going to work. But there are patients where OTCs do work, and even who are on opioids. So obviously, we haven't had PEMORs that long. So in my practicing lifetime, OTCs are what we often had to do. And they do work in some folks. And some people will tell you that has taken care of it. So I do think in a lot of our patients, it's appropriate to start with those drugs. And, and, and also, those, those drugs we know, we've, they've been around a long time. There's many of them in the in the class, Cinna is one of them, Biscotal is another one. And so, and sometimes it's worth trying a couple in the class because they all, not all patients respond the same in my experience to one. The second thing are then what I'll call secretagogues, and those are uh, drugs that are really lubricants, and lubiprostone fits into that, a very good drug uh, in that way. It does not work directly on the receptor for opioid-induced constipations. I think we have to be clear, while it can help, uh, it's, again, not a direct antagonist to the problem of opioid-induced constipation. And then, uh, certainly, the, the class of drugs, when at least when the OTC fail for me, uh, or maybe a secretagogue in addition, are the PEMORS. And PEMOR is uh, an acronym that uh, stands for Peripherally Acting Mu Receptor uh, Opioid Antagonist. Uh, so I think that that class of drugs are the new ones that have come about, and they are drugs that are peripherally restricted, that specifically reverse the effects we started the whole conversation off with that happens when the mu opioid receptor is activated in the gut. And I know we'll talk more about those, but uh, they have been very effective. And I think the reason is that they attack the problem at the source, which is what the opioid does when it uh, negatively impacts the mu receptor in the enteric plexus of the, the GI tract. Um, Jeff, being our pharmacology expert, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I, th I think it's important uh, that we recognize that the pomoras and actually the secretagogues as well are not laxatives. They are not laxatives, right? And so um, that's important. They are more for uh, prevention. And um, of the secretagogues, the lubiprostone is the, the only one of the two of them that actually has an FDA approval uh, for, for OIC, for opioid-induced constipation. Uh, but again, uh, as Rich pointed out, um, they, do not, they do not work specifically uh, at, at the site of the problem. That doesn't mean they won't work. I mean, uh, lubipostone is a chloride channel 2 agonist, and it will cause lubrication. But the problem is actually caused by the opioid combining with the mu receptor. And the Pomoras specifically have a higher finish for that receptor and prevent the opioid from binding. And so to me, that makes a lot of sense pharmacologically. There are not a lot of drugs that are, that are really sort of an antidote right, uh, to, to a problem. Um, and and uh, that is the case here. It actually blocks the problem from happening. I think that that's, uh, that that's really important. Um, and um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit uh, later about uh, the specific differences among the Pomoras. I think I'd add to that, Jeff. You know, it, as we said, it's not these don't always exist um, completely separate from each other. So I think sometimes when the Pomoras may not be as effective as we hope, we re we don't realize that there is this underlying idiopathic. A component. So sometimes we want to combine a lubiprostone with a PAMOR, and I've, I don't think we do that routinely. I don't think we need to routinely, but certainly uh, that has helped me with some of the really refractory cases. And I think also it just points that um, you can use these, uh, even OTC and PAMORs together occasionally uh, when one isn't enough. 
from a, from a simple clinician's point of view, I have to say I think it's absolutely fascinating that they're peripheral blockers, that this has nothing to do with blocking the central mu receptor, so it doesn't get in the way of your pain management. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But to me, that's fascinating that the pharmacologists can figure out how to do that. A very important point to make, Steve. Thank you.